And I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, God, I love you more than anything. I love you, Jesus. I worship and I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, want to tell you, God, I love you. I worship and adore you, just want to tell you, God, I love you more than anything. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you, just want to tell you that I love you more. I'll give it the highest praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, oh, hallelujah, 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 oh, one more time, hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the opportunity once again to come into your house, to praise you, to give you glory and honor. Father, to come together as one, one mind, one accord. God, that you might move and minister to us today. I just pray, God, that you would be glorified and honored in all that's done and said today. Father, we bless your name, Jesus. You are worthy of all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. We magnify you today. Move in every situation, move in every need, each and every heart, God. We lift them up to you today, God, believing and trusting for your will to be done. Father, we bless your name, Jesus. You are worthy of all the praise, worthy of all the glory, worthy of all the honor, Father. We worship you today. Thank you, Father. We love you more than anything, Jesus. We love you more than anything, Father. We lift up the Delinger family to you today, God, for Fred and Ravina that you'd minister to them. Touch Leonard Moose, God, today as he's going through these chemo treatments. God, I pray that you'd heal his body and do a work in him that only you can do, I pray in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for Jimmy White and William Sis, God, that you administer healing to them, Lord, as they're undergoing some different health issues, Father. For De Danette's son-in-law, God, I pray that you'd have your way in their lives, God, that you would move in them and draw them to you, Father. Let them feel your presence, your spirit, God, that only you can do, God. I pray in Jesus' name. Pray for Richard Ferguson and Debbie, God. I pray for Debbie as she's traveling today, Lord. I know that she said that she has a funeral to go to today, God. I pray that you move in that situation, that family, God, and touch Debbie and her health. God, minister healing in her body. Touch my Aunt Bertha, God. I pray that you minister her today. God, that you would heal her and deliver her, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Father, I pray for Celia today. God, we thank you for her faithfulness to this ministry and her giving. God, I pray that you'd open up a door for her, a job, God. And God, that you would heal her neck, God, and do a work in her that only you could do, I pray, in the name of Jesus. I pray for Kathy Gamble today, God, that you would minister as she's preparing to go into surgery for her back, God, that you would minister to her and heal her and do a work in her, I pray, in the name of Jesus, Father. I pray for uh, the Calvert family today, God, that you would minister to them and touch uh, Ashley's grandmother and touch her, her, her dad, God. I pray that you touch them and minister to them in the name of Jesus, Father. We lift up Matt's family to you today. God, that you would strengthen them, encourage them, God, as they're having to go through yet another death, God, in their family. I pray that you would minister to them and that you would strengthen them, encourage them, I pray. For Sue's family, God, as she's minister, uh, they're ministering to that family today, Lord, with the loss of her aunt, I pray, God, that you would minister to them in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would let them feel your touch, your strength, God, that only you can do. God, I pray for Maggie for healing, God. I pray for uh, th uh, this Hudson fellas dealing with the bronchitis, Lord, and for Sam Long, who has leg surgery scheduled, Lord, that you would bring healing and deliverance to their bodies, I pray, in the name of Jesus. Now, Father, I lift up this service to you this morning. Now, we've got so many folks that are in need, so many folks that are here that have needs. They need you, need your presence, need your power, need your anointing. We have some here that are not here this morning, God. And Lord, they need your touch and your strength. Let's pray, God, that you administer to them today in the name of Jesus. Father, you know what they have need of today. You know what they have need of today, Father, and we lift them up to you in the name of Jesus. You know where they are. You know what they're dealing with. 
you know what they're suffering with God and we just believe today God that your will is going to be done we surrender it all to you we give you the praise we give you the glory we give you the honor you are worthy of it all we bless you today we thank you for what you're about to do we ask all that we ask in Jesus name and all of God's people said amen would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise all right, let's worship together. God bless you.
worthy. He's worthy of praise. What a good God we serve. Amen. Amen. Appreciate you being in the house of the Lord this morning. Appreciate you coming out to worship the Lord with us and to receive from Him His Word. We're just looking forward to what the Lord has for us today. Uh, thank you for being here. Let me just, uh, while the team finds their seats, uh, let me just remind you of a few things that we do have going on this week. Um, I'm looking around. Kids church this morning? All right. So as soon as we get done with these announcements, our kids, part of kids church can go and have a part in your service this morning. Um, service tonight here at the church at 6 o'clock. I encourage you to come out tonight. We're just uh, looking forward to a good time in the Lord tonight. And uh, see what the Lord has for us. Prayer meeting tomorrow night at uh, uh, 6, 6 o'clock here at the church. And then Wednesday night, our service uh, Bible study, studying the book of James. I encourage you to come out for that. Uh, for the adults and then our, our kids and our youth and our young adult classes that take place on Wednesday nights. It's always a good time in the Lord, so I encourage you to come out for that. Last for Life is coming up this uh, Saturday. If you've signed up or if you're sponsored, if you're participating, uh, if you've uh, committed to sponsor somebody, we need those funds by Friday. So make sure that you, you get with those that you've sponsored if you've not already done so. And uh, if you'd like to come out and just be supportive of what's going on, uh, there will be all kind of booths and things for the kids and stuff like that. And so I uh, um, encourage you to come out at Covenant Church starting at 9 o'clock uh, Saturday morning. A week from ne uh, next Sunday, uh, the Christian ministers will be having their hunger walk. be coming up on uh, the 22nd of October. They'll be meeting at the uh, office there at 2.30. So I encourage you to go out and be a part of that. Truck or treats coming up at the end of the month at the social services. This is a district-wide thing. And uh, as I told you before, we've got the candy part covered. All you got to do is, uh, if you want to decorate a trunk and um, be a part of that, and I know that'll be a, a great blessing to you. So, uh, truck or treats coming up the uh, end of the month. All right, what else we got left? Senior adult ministry on the 28th. That Saturday, there's going to be a cookout. Is that here at the church? At Joe and Susan's. Okay, cool. So there are going to be some games and food, all that good stuff. So seniors, make sure you sign up on uh, at the welcome desk and uh, so that we can have a head count for that. If you got any questions about that, see Brother Jim. He can tell you more about it. Holiday paint night's coming up the 7th of November on a Tuesday evening from 6.30 to 8.30. There's a sign-up sheet for this also. We're going to be painting some uh, door hangers, uh, holiday door hangers. So uh, if you any questions about that, see Paula. She can tell you more about that. That's coming up uh, very quickly. And if you're interested in the sign language class, please see Tracy. She can tell you more about that. And uh, just looking forward to some of you folks learning to communicate in different ways. So uh, that's going on. That it? All right. That's it. Thank you again for coming to the Lord's house. Our kids can't be dismissed this time. Appreciate you being in the Lord's house. If you have your Bibles, if you turn with me to Luke chapter 8. It's good to see Joan and Frank. Love you guys. Don't you call me out. It's too late. Already done it. It's good to see them all. I love these guys. Appreciate you coming to the Lord's house to worship today. I just found out this morning. I knew, I knew he was sick, but I found out what happened this morning. Uh, our Hispanic ministry, the Apostolic Assembly, uh, meets in our building. They're like family to us, and uh, or they're like family to me. I, I can't speak for you. I'll speak for me, but... Uh, they're like family to me, and uh, we had a great conference yesterday, about 700 people here, and uh, just had a good time with the Lord, and uh, started about 8 o'clock yesterday morning, and I, I left about 6.30 yesterday evening, so uh, it's a good long day, uh, uh, tearing down, setting up, and just service unto God, but the co-pastor, uh, the associate pastor over, his name is Enyo, and uh, I knew he, was, he wasn't here yesterday, and I heard, uh, they told me he was sick, but his wife spoke to me this morning, and he had a mild heart attack. And uh, so I want to ask you to hold him up in prayer. His name is Enyo. And uh, you'd know him if you see him because half the time he's the one that's running me down for different issues and different stuff. But uh, he, his wife shared with me this morning he had a mild heart attack and uh, asked us to pray for him. So uh, as we pray today and as you pray throughout your day, please remember him today uh, that God would touch him and, and, and do a healing in his body. So uh, we're believing for the Lord to do that. If you would, let's stand and we're going to go to the 
uh, before the word of the Lord and, and, and prayer, and then we're going to get right into the message this morning. Luke chapter 8, beginning with verse 42. Luke chapter 8, beginning with verse 42. This is the latter portion of verse 42 that we're going to start with. The Bible said, but as he went, talking about Jesus, the multitudes thronged him. Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any, came from behind, touched the border of the hem of his garment, and immediately her flow of blood stopped. And Jesus said, who touched me? When all denied it, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitudes throng and press you, and you say, who touched me? But Jesus said, Somebody touched me, for I perceive power going out from me. Now when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared to him in the presence of all the people the reason she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said to her, Daughter, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. Go in peace. I want to continue. We've been talking about revival and we're talking about you know, the move of God and the presence of God. And I want to continue this morning talking about revival, but I want to talk about revival that heals the issues. Revival that heals the issues. I like the way Kat put it this morning. She said, I don't have enough tissues to deal with my issues. So I already like honesty in the house this morning. When you got issues, you might as well just go ahead and admit, I got issues. Amen. Anybody in the house got issues this morning? Let's just go ahead and be honest with one another. We got it. Well, I'm talking about there's a move of God that can heal your issues. No matter how small or insignificant you feel it is, no matter how big you may think it is, God has a move of His Spirit, His power, and His presence that can touch and minister to your issues this morning. So let's ask God to have His way. I'm not going to talk so much about our individual issues as I am going to talk about the issues of church. You okay with me this morning? Everybody has individual issues, but when we bring all those issues together in the church, it just means the church has issues. How are we going to fix those? God has a way of moving His Spirit to help us do, to overcome those issues. So let's pray together. Ask God to touch me today. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you right now, God, that you'd minister to me and minister through me. God, that you'd speak to my heart. Help me, Lamb of God, to do and say what you'd have me to say today. I surrender all that I am and all that I desire to be. God, I give it to you. I believe and entrust it for your will to be done, Father. I ask you to touch the ears of the hearers today. God, as we go through this next few moments in your word, God, that you would help us to be drawn closer to you. As I prayed this morning, God, I pray, Lord, that you would heal us, and that you would deliver us from the things that would try to bind us and cause us to become incapable of doing what you called us to do. The things that are attacking our, our, our spiritual wounds. The things that are attacking our fruitfulness. God, that are inhibiting us. I pray in the name of Jesus. God, that you would speak and move and minister in lives today. Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for what you're about to do. And Father, just in, as, a, as, a, as a joining of prayer together, God, I want us to lift up our brother Enyel today to you. God, that you would heal his body. Touch him and strengthen him even right now. He loves you, Lord. Serves you and worships you, God. I've watched this man, God, just serve you in different capacities. I love him. He's a brother. I just pray, God, that you minister to him and let him feel your strength, your touch, God, that only you can give today. And, Father, we thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what you're going to do this morning. We give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. This organism that we call the church, it's alive. Sometimes the organization of it can become very ill. It's hard to, uh, it's not hard to know when it happens because when it happens, when, when the church really becomes ill and affected by the issues that are within it, that vision becomes blurred. Budgets become bloated. Hearing gets dull. The harvest is, is hindered. The outreach is withered. Revival flatlines and, 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 and as, as a slow, continual bleeding saps the church of her strength and her ability to be effective. When this happened, prayer turns to manipulation. Commitment yields to compromise and what was fervent evangelism erodes to a low-grade fever of half-hearted and listless programs. 
soon as the as, as the as with the church of Laodicea that we see in Revelation chapter 3 we find that when this begins to happen that Jesus stands at the door knocking of the church and saying would you just allow me to come in we we think that we become to the place like this church that we have need of nothing and we don't even realize that we're wretched and miserable and poor and blind in a word the church in of itself has become ill especially in America and there's much decline that we're having to deal with in our particular text this morning we're talking about a hemorrhaging woman that is very representative of the church today and it typifies the crisis of the contemporary church she was a little miss nobody from nowhere with nothing and it seemed that everything was working against her and, and for 12 years she had suffered by spending all her money and not even coming close to finding healing oh yeah Dr. Pharisee and Dr. Sadducee were very happy to take her money along with Dr. Tradition and Dr. Religion had no opportunity at all to bring her any kind of hope but soon she heard of a great physician she had heard of this man named Jesus and what Jesus was able to do and the Bible tells us that, that, that her faith arose with inside of her and she made a declaration if he ever comes to my town and gets on my street if I can only touch the hem of his garment I know that I can be made whole amazingly Jesus comes to where she was comes to her town and comes just close close enough for this sick woman to touch him at a place where all the loose ends come together. Amen. God has a way of bringing it all together. And this woman touches him there at the hem of his garment. And the Bible said instantly, immediately, that the flow of blood dried up. And Jesus recognized that this virtue or this power had left him and moved out of him and into somebody else. He asked the question, who touched me? Jesus asked this question and by the time this woman had slipped away into the crowd to hide herself, listen, it wasn't even legal for her to be there. She wasn't even supposed to be in the crowd. According to the Mosaic law and the Judaistic law, she wasn't even supposed to be there. This woman was unclean. She was ceremonially unclean for 12 years. She had separated herself. But she said something within her rose up. If I can just get to this man named Jesus, if I can just get to the place that I can touch him, if I can get to the place that he can do this work in my life I know that my life can be changed my life can be different due to this issue of blood that was in her she had been declared unclean and shouldn't even been there but the scripture reveals that she could not be healed from Jesus Jesus knew exactly what had happened this merciful Lord located her and called her the Bible said that he called her daughter see the Bible didn't call see Jesus didn't refer to her according to some legality the Bible said that Jesus didn't refer to her as just by some happenstance name. But the Bible said that he referred to her with a name that was sealed by covenant. Daughter. Daughter. He said unto her, Daughter, your faith has made you whole. It's amazing to me that Jesus was not afraid to link himself to this woman. You see, because by her touching him, he should have been unclean. But Jesus wasn't afraid to say, she's the one that touched me. Jesus wasn't afraid to say, she was unclean, but because she touched me, not only am I still clean, but now she's clean. Let me tell you something, friend. Jesus has a way of linking himself with people, especially with this woman that had been a castaway by those that were around her. But cleansing and covenant had brought them together. This story is a story of provision. This story is a story of grace as well as a remarkable account of the healing power of Christ. But certainly, it is a picture of the Lord's desire to heal the issues of the church so that once healed, the church can reach out to the generations that are in our future and become what's healthy and powerful, the force that God has called us to be that we can influence the world before Jesus Christ returns. And let me tell you something, friend. He's coming. He's coming. But if we're going to talk about it, let's back up for just a little bit because we really need to look at the, the, the whole context of the picture. What happens is, is that a man by the name of Jairus in Luke chapter 8 verse 41, we see that Jairus has a daughter that's of 12 years old that has fallen sick. 
and uh, Jairus comes to him in Luke 8 41 that Jairus comes he's a ruler of the synagogue and he falls down at Jesus' feet and begs him to come to his house and so we see here that Jairus is this man that has revelation as a matter of fact this name means enlightened or one who has received revelation and, and what a powerful revelation that he receives as a matter of fact there's two of them that I want to share with you this morning number one Jairus comes to understand that Jesus was the Messiah Jesus was that one that was foretold of by the prophets by having access to the Old Testament parchments at the synagogue, being a ruler of the synagogue. He had read about the manna, that, that, the, the feeding of the manna unto the Israelites. He had read about how the water sprung forth from the rock when Moses hit it with his staff. And he understood that even the brazen serpent that Moses had lifted up for all to see was a type of a coming deliverance. And so as Jairus walked around the city, he had heard about this man that walked on water, this man that raised the dead, this man that had words of eternal life and he began to put it all together and he came to this revelation knowledge that Jesus was the Christ of prophecy. You say it's still a glorious truth. Jesus is not merely a teacher and he's simply not the son of the carpenter but the fact is that Jesus Christ is Lord, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, that Jesus Christ is the healer, that Jesus Christ is my Savior. Thank God for Jesus. Jesus. Thank God that he's done what he's done in my life. All this revelation that J.R. has had that Jesus is the Messiah. Along with this stirring truth, J.R. has got a second revelation in this particular scripture. Not only did he recognize him as the Savior, as the Messiah, but he recognized that if I worship him at his place, he'll come to my place. <laughs> He said, I fell down and worshipped him and begged him to come to my house. Anybody need Jesus at your house? Yeah. Yeah. What do you do, preacher? I come to his house to worship him so that he'll come with me to my house so that he'll be with me with my family. He'll walk with my daughters. He'll, he'll be with my wife. I, I come to where he is and say, Lord, I need you. Let me tell you something, friend. We gotta have a mind made up that once we get a hold of the Lord that we're not gonna let him go. We gotta go ahead and make up our mind that once we get something from God that we can't turn it loose. I heard a message yesterday. Pastor Ramos preached it. He said, you gotta hold fast to what at God. Whatever God's blessed you with, whatever God's poured in your life, your salvation, your peace, your joy, your love, whatever you're holding on to, hold fast to it because the enemy wants to devour and steal it from you. You better hold on to it. Listen to me, friend. We got to quit coming to church every Sunday in and Sunday out and trying to replenish what we lost. We need to hang on and maintain what God's blessed us with so that we can continue to move forward in the things of God. Can somebody say Amen. He said, listen, he had it right. If I go to where Jesus is, he'll come to my house. Worship still brings Jesus to the house. Look at Psalm 22 and, 22 and verse 3. He said he inhabits or he is enthroned on the praises of Israel. God inhabits the praises of his people. Jairus was desperate. You see, when you get desperate, you'll do desperate things. You see, when everything's going well, hard to get somebody to praise the Lord when everything's going good. Come on now. <laughs> it's hard to get somebody to really worship God when everything's right. It's hard to get God, to, it's hard to get the attention of God and the attention of people when it seems everything's in order. People just kind of lackadaisically approach the things of God. And they, they don't really put all the effort and the heart in it that they do. But let me tell you something, friend. I read in the Word of God where Jesus came to the other side of the sea. And the Bible said that when he stepped out of the boat onto the seashore of Gadara, that a man that was bound with thousands of demons come fell at the feet of Jesus and worshiped him. Let me tell you something, friend. Not even a legion of demons could hold a man back from falling on his face and worshiping God. So what's wrong with the church when we're not bound and afflicted by the power of the enemy? How in the world could a man bound with demonic powers still fall and worship Jesus? What's wrong with us in the church that we've got an issue that we can't even worship God the way that he's worthy to be worshiped? I ask you the question today, what is it that's holding you back? I promise you it's not a legion of devils. It's not a legion of powers of devils out of hell. But I'm telling you, we let the issues get in the way from really being what God's called us to be. This man fell down and worshiped Jesus. Lord, son of David, what have we got to do with you? They began to worship him and fell at his feet. 
So in churches today, if it ain't the right song, they don't want to worship. If it ain't the right preacher, they don't want to worship. I'm going to let that one marinate a minute. If it, ain't, if it ain't the right atmosphere, if the, if the temperature ain't right, if my seat's been taken, or, or, if, or somebody says something to me coming in the door, it just inhibits our worship. But this man with a legion of devils still fell. Oh my. Still fell at the feet of Jesus. Let me tell you something, friend. We got to get over our excuses and we got to get over ourselves and we got to get over our issues and realize I just got to come to his feet. I just got to come to the place where it all comes together. Listen, my life might be a shredded mess. My life might be all in frazzles. But what I know is if I can just touch the place where it all comes together, my God is going to be able to heal me and do a work in my life. He needed Jesus. Because his only daughter was about to die. You'd be different in your approach to the Lord this morning if there was tragedy in your life. Come on now. I told the Lord this morning, I said, God, it absolutely amazes me. When I look back over the history of our country, when tragedy strikes in the country, how that the the, the, the country just comes together. We, we don't think about, we don't think about, I think about 9-11. They, 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 listen, ACLU, you didn't hear a word from them for months after at 9-11. You didn't hear them arguing about, you know, just here recently, the Freedom From Religion Act. They, 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 got, a, they got a big push right now called Bring Your Bible to School. And the Freedom From Religion company, uh, uh, a group is coming together because uh, 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 go, the governor, I believe it was, from Kentucky stood up and said, listen, you ought to join in this. Tell the kids they ought to join in this. And, and they said, this ain't right. You're using government offices to, to promote religion. No, we're just telling kids to bring the truth to school. We're just telling kids to bring the Bible to school. Listen, friend, you, you want your freedom from religion. I want my freedom in religion that I can do what I'm supposed to do. Listen, that we love my God help me today. I'm telling you, we're living in a nation right now that wants to advocate tolerance, but they won't be tolerant of a Christian that wants to live their life. I'm telling you, friend, we gotta wake up and realize that there is adversity and issues that are coming against the church. J. Iris was desperate. He said, my daughter's dying. I can't just sit by. I can't just sit and twiddle my thumbs. I can't sit and moan and groan about the atmosphere. I can't moan and groan about what's going on in my life or on my job. My daughter is dying. I'm telling you right now, if one of my babies was sick, and there was sickness or unto death that was coming unto them. You wouldn't see me just come in here and sit down and whine about the temperature or whine about what the preacher's saying or what singers are saying. No, friend. I just got to get a hold of Jesus. I got to get a hold of Jesus. Why? Because I need him to come to my house. I'm desperate. There's something inside of me that says I can't just sit idly by any longer. I just can't sit by listening to me, friend. Money wouldn't matter to me anymore. Things wouldn't matter to me anymore. I wouldn't worry about reporting for the job the next day. Not if my daughter was dying. I'd have to find somebody that could help my baby. And let me tell you something, friend. When you get desperate enough and you realize that the physician is there, you realize that the great physician is there and his name is Jesus, you'll call on his name. You'll go to where he is. Is and you'll get his attention. I'm telling you, friend, you won't care what length you got to travel. You won't care what people say. You won't care what people do. There's a desperation inside of you that says, I've got to touch him because if I can touch him, my life will be made different. Come to my house, Jesus. She's dying. See, I, I, I don't want to read that he had any sons or, or we don't know that he even had any other daughters. But this child represents Jairus' legacy as well as his future. And if she dies, everything that he's invested into her dies with her. There's a, a young generation church that's hanging in the balance today. There's young people and young adults that are hanging in the balance. And I'm going to tell you something, friend. This young generation needs to be, let me back up for just a minute. The older generation, and I may not be talking to any of you, so don't get offended, but the older generation have got to get over their wishy-washiness. Are you with me? We wonder why young people can't get it because they ain't seeing it. Come on now. 
We want to, listen, my girls, they don't need to see me just shout at church. They need to see me worship at home. They need to hear me say Jesus' name when I'm at home. They need to see me open my Bible when I'm at home. They need to know that I'm going to worship God. If I'm in the pulpit, if I'm singing a song here, I can sing a song at the house. I can sing a song riding down the road. I can sing a song when I got a phone call that was bad. I can still get off the phone, hang up the phone, and say, blessed be the name of the Lord. I'm telling you, friends, they got to know that your, that your testimony is sure that that your testimony is true that it ain't a Sunday thing it ain't a Wednesday night thing but it's a life thing because my life is going to be a life of worship unto God see if they fail to see us live live to see their day the legacy of our fathers as well as the future of a vibrant church is going to be lost the Bible tells us in Psalm 107 and 20 that God is continually sending his word he sent his word and it healed them and delivers them from all their destructions but in this case the Word made flesh became personally involved. <laughs> See, there was a generation at stake. There was a generation at stake. And Jesus wanted to stand by their side and lay His life-giving hands on them personally. Without a doubt, Jesus Christ has tuned in to this generation. This young generation, this new generation, if you will, of young people that are passionate about His kingdom. More so, there's a new generation that's tuned into Him Possibly like anything ever, ever before. They, they've got a song. They've got language. They, they've got an appearance that is uniquely their own. But their passion has roots that are 2,000 years old going all the way back to the day of Pentecost. See, this is really what it boils down to. J. Iris' daughter was 12 years old. This woman had suffered with 12 years of affliction. I, I, and I find it amazing to me. And let me, let me just put it to you this way without sounding harsh. I find it amazing that the enemy decided to attack this young girl at 12 just as she was entering her fruit-bearing age. Are you with me? Here she was, probably at a place in a position of puberty, transition going on in her body at 12 years of age, and the enemy decides to attack her at this time. The older woman, sick with an issue of blood for 12 years, isn't it amazing that the sickness and illness that she was dealing with was attacking her ability to be fruitful? Because as long as she was dealing with this issue, there would never be any kind of intimacy. Are you with me this morning? You see, you got to understand that this young girl coming in this generation, the enemy said, I better stop her before she even has the ability. And this older generation, I better go ahead and put a clamp down on this fruitfulness and stop her from even coming into a place of intimacy. You see, when you're so focused on your issue, you can never be intimate. That's what it boils down to, church. we got to come back to a place that we begin, begin, begin becoming intimate with the Father so that we can once again become fruitful and that we can bear much fruit and that our fruit can remain. See, the enemy wants to attack our young people because the last thing he wants them to do is fall in love with Jesus. The enemy wants to attack our young adults because the last thing he wants them to do is really have an experience in the Lord. The enemy wants to distract them with stuff that, that, that just hinders them. The enemy wants to use all this stuff, these, these, these things, to, to really distract them away from the truth because if they'll ever know the truth, that truth will make them free. So, so he attacks them at this place of fruitfulness. This woman had been bleeding and sick for as long as the young girl had been alive. She was threatened again with her own fruit bearing. And because of this illness, she could not have an intimate relationship that would produce children. See, get it straight. Again, Satan does not want the church to bear fruit. He's not, listen, he's not upset with us meeting this morning. Are you with me? He, he's not the least bit offended that you saying, I love you. Oh, how I love you. That doesn't bother him at all. He knows you love him. He, he's not affected by you at all. But if you ever start messing in his territory, if you ever start messing with people that he's got a hold on, 
if you ever get back to the place where you're casting out devils, if you ever get back to the place where you're rebuking the enemy and the enemy's having to flee, if you ever get back to the place that you're fully committed and surrendered to the plan of God and you're really walking in the power of the kingdom, listen, he's going to begin to attack you and begin, begin, begin to bring resistance against you, trying to stop you from doing what God's called you to do. Because he's just, listen, he's okay as long as you do a service as usual. He doesn't care. Listen, you can dance the aisles and it doesn't offend him. Matter of fact, he probably sending somebody here to dance with you. Just to keep you stirred up in your emotion. That's for another time. But you know where I'm going. He doesn't, mind, he doesn't mind your antics. He doesn't mind your Pentecostalism. He doesn't mind your, your, your worship. He doesn't mind your charisma. But what affects him is when you really begin to tool and toy into his areas. You really start to expose him. He doesn't like that kind of stuff. And so, so this place that, 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 that he come at, he, he's not intimidated by these things, but he despises the thought of our ability to reproduce disciples. See, the will of God is that the church be fruit-bearing. And that our fruit remain. Sadly and too often the church has been ill for as long as this young generation has been alive. I think about it, man. I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of in, in a straight betwixt two here. I, I'm not in that older, older generation. But I'm not so young that, that I'm in this newer generation. So, so I, I'm kind of I'm kind of looking at the older generation whom I love and respect and honor and, and thank God for my heritage and my background. And I look at them and I say, Lord, I wouldn't be where I'm at if it wasn't for riding on the shoulders of these folks because they're the ones that carried me to the place that I am. But then I look back at this younger generation and, and I see this gulf between us. And I'm sitting there saying to myself, What in the world is going on? They, they, they're, they're not getting it. They're not getting it. They, they, they're, they're looking down at them and they're you know, talking bad about them. And somehow or another, we got issues that somehow we got to bring this thing together. You know, I, I, see, this young church has been fighting to live. They've been fighting to live while this older generation has been dealing with bloody, repulsive issues. The only thing that's going to bring that together is a revival. The only thing, and listen, I'm not talking about me bringing an evangelist here. Please, I, I know I've said that several times over the last several weeks, but it's not about bringing an evangelist here. It's about a true move of God that's going to bring this generation together with this generation and somehow or another fix this generation and say, listen, you got to come together. I want you to be one. I want you to walk in the same power, with the same mind, with the same understanding, washed in the same blood. I want to do this in your life because I'm the only one that can heal these issues. But as the church has gotten older, the issues have changed. They've become much more complex than they once were. See, there was a day when the church worried herself with external things, such as long, how long is too long, how short is too short, and how much is too much. But see, and, and, and I, understand, I understand those things, but really what they were, those were the indicators of deeper problems. They're indicators of deeper problems. See, for many years, the agendas of many denominational conventions were dominated by motions and amendments that kept more people out of their fellowships than were allowed in. More time was spent building barriers than bridges because too many churches or too many in the church believed that holiness was hardness. Listen, I'm a holiness preacher. I'm not going to back down from that. But I still believe in loving people. The issues the church deals with today present many serious, serious challenges. And I want to address a few of those this morning. Number one, there's an issue of moral impurity. Moral impurity. And listen, I'm not talking about the world. The, listen, I expect sinners to act like sinners. I, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I, I don't want to condemn them because they're already being judged. Sinners are going to act like Sinners. You know, I, I got a text this morning about a young man that sat right here in these chairs that's sitting in county jail right now for, for drug distribution. Locked away, cocaine and drug paraphernalia and resisting arrest and all kind of things that took place. And when I looked at that, man, my heart broke. My heart broke as I looked at the picture and I looked at the pity in that face. And I thought to myself, the times that we've loved on them and, and reached out to them, and I can't help to tell you that I asked the question, God, could we done more? I know there was a lot that was done, and please don't think I'm throwing stones at people that did stuff, but I'm telling you, friend, my heart breaks when I think that people think that their situation has become so hopeless 
that they turn to the things of the world. We're dealing with social moral impurity, but it's not just about within the world. I expect that, but I'm talking about a moral cancer that's invaded the church to the point that there's few absolutes. There's no distinctives anymore. There's a mockery that's made among Christians, a, a mockery of, that's made of marriage among Christian leaders, and vices are excused. There's tolerated and accepted behavior. This is the stuff we're seeing in the church. There's currently a blurring of the lines in today's church. We don't know what's right and wrong anymore. It might be all right for you, but it ain't all right for them. And that, this one here is all, uh, listen, there's no, uh, listen, I still believe that the scriptures are absolute. What God said 2,000 years ago, He still means in 2017. There's things that have not changed. Listen, I know society's changed, and there's blurring of the lines. And so where are the absolutes? We've forsaken biblical principles like holiness and substituting, uh, uh, substituting instead an inferior gospel of compromise and acceptance of the ways of the world. It's time for, is it time for the church to return to the doctrinal stance that we still profess but do not practice? We talk a good game sometimes. We talk about how much we love Jesus. And Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. It's a clear call for the church to return to moral purity. And to come out from among the world and embrace again the principles of holiness. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean and I will receive you. We've got an issue of moral impurity in the church. We've got an issue of racial diversity. Let's call it what it is, folks. We got racial diversity. God's brought the nations to the doorsteps of the American church and we'll be judged by God and man according to how we respond. See, the church is, the church is called to carry the whole gospel to every race, every tribe, every kindred, and every tongue. The church must also be accepted and welcome to nations into their doors. You know what moved my heart yesterday? Yesterday they had a part of the program that they brought in flags from every nation, every Hispanic nation, and, and, and they, the, uh, Paraguay and Brazil and, and Panama and, and the Caribbean, I mean, every, every nation, and they just cheered as they come in. But the last group to come in, come in with the American flag. And I stood in the back and I watched 700 or plus Hispanic folks stand and sing the national anthem. And I thought to myself, man, I wish everybody in America could see this right now. They're appreciative of their heritage. They're appreciative of their background. But man, they stood at attention when it came to the American flag. And they said, listen, we're in America. I know where our history is. I know where my background is. But we stand together for as America. Listen, they came from Mexico. They came from Panama. They came from all these places. But they came to America. And they said, we're going to stand together somewhere or another. we got to bridge the gap in the, in the nation and say, we got to come together. Hispanic folks love Jesus. Black folks love Jesus. Chinese folks love Jesus and some way or another we got to get over our racial prejudices and say you know what we got to come together for the gospel of Jesus Christ it's amazed me how some people will empty their pockets to save a man in the jungles of the Congo but that same man showed up in church on Sunday morning some will be bothered by his presence for a long time now a healthy church is at least in part measured by its willingness to embrace people that are different. And believe you me, folks, I'm looking forward to the day that the church looks different. I don't want to be the white church in the factory. All right, half of you, amen me. I don't want to be the white church in the factory. I, I don't want to, I, I, don't, I, I want people, no matter what their background is, what their history is, I don't want to be just the church in the factory that, that, that people look at and say, you don't, you're not going to be accepted at that church. They're going to treat you different if you walk in that door. They, they're going to look at you oddball if you come in looking like that. Listen, I, I, I want to be the church that says, you know what? Whosoever will, let them come and drink of the water of life freely. Listen, friend, if they got background, they got issues, I want them to know that this is a place that they can find healing for their issues. They can find Jesus here and if they touch the hem of his garment they can surely be made whole I'm telling you friend that's what we gotta be we gotta be a church unto the nations we gotta be a church that says we can make a difference because Jesus is here we worship him he pray and have us the praises and something's gonna happen in this place we gotta issue a moral impurity we gotta issue a racial diversity we gotta issue a social responsibility social responsibility 
I believe with all my heart in today's world that more of the gospel is going to be preached outside of church buildings than they are within. Put pissed than, than they'll be within them. In truth, more of a, a, believable, a believable gospel will actually be proclaimed in food pantries and homeless shelters and unwed mothers' homes and prisons and, and CPCs and different ministries. That, that, that's where the gospel is going to come forth. And you're going to hear an articulated, uh, uh, and what you're going to hear is going to be articulated from the tongues of some of the best orators because they've got an experience. It's not going to be great grand preachers standing up in pulpits just wowing people with their oratory skills. It's going to be common lay people that are just get in the ditches and say, listen, Jesus can make a difference in your life. That's where the gospel is going to be manifested. I, I believe that with all my heart. One of the contributing factors to the illness of some churches has been their inward and self-serving approach to ministry. We, we, we do what we do to try to keep ourselves together. I told the Lord this morning in prayer, and I, I, I hate to keep harping on this. Uh, I just want you to know where my heart is. I said, God, some way or another, you got to deliver us from the debt of what we got going here because we're spending thousands and thousands of dollars into a building that, that's really serving no great purpose when we can really be serving the community and making a difference in somebody's life. God, help us some way or another to get out from under the burden of this debt so that we can be what God's called us to be, that we can serve the kingdom. Listen, friend, I told you, I don't need lights and cameras anymore. I'm not worried about or and trying to impress people I just want to see God's kingdom come forward and he served the purpose that he called us to serve and be what God's called us to be God help us help us see too many continually involve themselves in their own Sunday huddle catering to their own isolated culture of niceness we cater to one another while in the shadows of our steeples there's hungry people that have no bread homeless people just in these woods right here that have no shelter they have no shelter. And we got to be able to comprehend what it is to be salt of the earth and light of the world according to Matthew 5, 13 through 16. Look what he said. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? If it's good, then it's good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor did they light a lamp and put it under a basket. But, but on a lampstand, it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Listen, this is what we're called to do, folks. I'm sharing with a pastor friend of mine today, uh, yesterday, and I told him, I said, listen, we, 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 we've come to the place, and you've heard me say this, but we've come to the place that we're trying to be attractional. We're no longer missional. I, I, listen, can I confess? I'm doing what I do to just try to hold it together to keep you coming back every Sunday. And look around. It ain't working too well. I, listen, I get just as disheartened as you do when I walk in here and see this family gone, that family gone. It bothers me probably more so than you, me than it does you, to be honest with you. Because I'm their pastor. It troubles me. And, and So what do we do? We just hold the line, keep on doing what we're doing, hoping that it'll turn around? Or do we really make up our mind and say, you know what, God? Enough's enough. Somewhere or another, we got to touch you that the bleeding can stop. Somewhere or another, God, something's got to turn around. You know, I, I understand that people are going to make their decisions. I understand that. But that doesn't stop the fact that we got to make up our mind. What are we going to do that's going to make a difference for the kingdom? Are we just going to sit here and wallow in our pity and tell God for the last 12 years, Lord, I've just bled out myself, I've used all my resources? Isn't it amazing that I'm bringing this message this morning and we're getting ready to enter our 12th year? Isn't it amazing? You know what? That actually just dawned on me. Do, do, do we say, you know what, God? You know, that woman could have sat in her house and said, I'm just going to bleed to death. She said, you know what? Forget the rules. I know the rules said I'm not supposed to go in public. I know the rules says I'm not supposed to touch him. I know the rules say that I'm not. Forget the rules. Somewhere or another, desperation has to kick in and say, now I'm not in the point of dying. I'm in a point of just trying to live. And whatever I got to do to live, if that means getting stomped on, trampled on while I make my way through a crowd to touch his garment, then I'll do what I got to do. I just need somebody to help me stop the bleeding. What do we do, church? 
Where do we go from here? What, what, what decisions need to be made? Hold the line, Pastor. Just keep doing what you're doing. Keep preaching like you're preaching. Keep singing like you're singing. Bring us a, bring us a three points and a poem and give us an all to call. And we're just going to hang here with you, preacher. Where's that getting us? Listen, we rejoice over we rejoice over nuggets, and I, I'm thankful for those things. We rejoice over Sarah's and, 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 and Darren's and, that come to the altar like they did last Sunday. Man, I thank God for what he did there. I thank God for what he's doing in those lives. But, but what's going on? What about the Jasons that are sitting here drug addicted? They're sitting in a, and they sat right here in these same chairs. And now all of a sudden they say, well, I have no more hope. So I'm going to turn myself back over to the things of the world. Listen, I think about these Jasons, and I think about, okay, when I was praying for him this morning, I said, God, this man got hit by a car, got hit so hard by the car that it knocked him out of his pants. Knocked him out of his pants. And I went and saw him a day later in the hospital, and he was able to sit and talk to me. You don't live through that without the grace of God. And my heart breaks. Please hear me this morning. I'm not beating up on you. Please don't take it that way. My heart breaks that we think that we can just continue on and hold fast and stay in the house and let the bleeding continue. And somehow or another we're going to survive. Somebody's got to be willing to step out the door and say, i got to go find him. I don't know if he's here anymore. I don't know if he's working anymore. I don't know if he's doing anymore. i got to go find him. I don't know where Jesus is. But if he'll come by my place, I'm going to get a hold of him. And if I can touch him, I'm going to grab hold like Mary did. And I'm not letting him go. I'm going to bring him back to the house. And somewhere or another, if i got to beg him like Jairus did, please come to my house. We're dying here. We need you. We need you. Listen, I want, to be, I want to be very frank with you this morning. This is not hopeless. This is not hopeless. Please don't construe what I'm telling you this morning as a hopeless situation. It's not hopeless. God's still on the throne. There's breath still in my body. The blood's still flowing. Jesus is still exalted. He's still King of kings and Lord of lords. So it is not going to be construed as a hopeless situation. But if all I'm doing is putting hope in this only, I'm of all men most miserable. See, it's not about this. It's about letting our light shine before them that they can glorify our Father who's in heaven. This is what we're called to do in Matthew chapter 25. Beginning with verse 35, Jesus made it clear that there's a great reward for those who involve themselves in, in a ministry to the hungry and the destitute. By helping those whom Jesus referred to as the least of these, my brethren. That's what he talks about. He said, listen, you, you've done it. if you've done it unto these, you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren. You've done it unto me. So he's teaching us here that we actually have rendered this ministry unto him. So growing churches in America today are those that are involved in the least of these ministry. When, you, when you're taking care of people, when you're reaching people, we're not like that church that you've heard me quote the statistic of the 300-member church that was asked, why is this church here? 85% of them said to meet my need. It's sad. We, we don't need to be that kind of people. Listen, what need do you have that he can't meet? So if Jesus said, seek me first, and all this other stuff. In other words, Matthew 6.33, if I can paraphrase it a minute. Jesus said, seek me first and I'll take care of the issues. Are you with me? If you'll just come after me. If you'll just do what I've told you to do. I got the issues taken care of. Don't get tripped up by the issues. Don't get stumbled over the, the problems. Don't, don't get held back by, by, by your insufficiencies. I can be sufficient in your life if you'll just keep pressing after me. There has to be a hunger and a desire that, that, that you're saying to God, God, I've got to look beyond my problem and somewhere or another I've got to be able to move into the thing. Listen, you, you may have read about these horrible sins of Sodom and Gomorrah, but there's an interesting verse of Scripture that's found in Ezekiel 16, 49. I, I, I want you to listen to this verse. He said, look, th this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. She and her daughter and her pride uh, had pride and fullness of food and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Talking about Sodom here. Sodom 
was destroyed because of their abominations. But look what Ezekiel said. She and her daughter had pride. They had plenty of food. They had the abundance of idleness. In other words, they, they, they could just take it easy. But they didn't strengthen the hand of the poor. And they didn't take care of the needy. Look, look at this. What, what an indictment. Could this possibly be spoken of, of the church today? I've blessed you with so much. I poured out so many blessings on your life. Look what I've done for you. And like that Laodicean church, we stand and we say, Lord, I'm rich and increased. I have need of nothing. And the Lord said, you don't even realize you're blind. You're miserable. You're wretched. You're poor. You're naked. Why? Because we didn't give attention to the weight of your things. We didn't give attention to the things that God has called us attention to. Listen, may these words never be st- spoken up by of the church when we stand before God in the judgment. There's an issue of doctrinal fidelity. There's a growing compromise and diluting of fundamental doctrines in the church today. Right is no longer right. Wrong is no longer wrong. Somehow or another, the two have merged, and we got into a feel-good kind of doctrine. So in an effort to blend in and be sensitive, there's an accompanying erosion of truth. I, 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 again, I had a meeting yesterday morning with a, a dear friend of mine as a pastor, and he was t- sharing with me, he and I planted churches about the same time. He planted a little before I did. And he told me, he said, you know, the, 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 the state office, it was Church of God. He said the state office came, and they wanted to merge me with this other church. And he said it was about seven or eight people that came in. And, and this was his admission. He said, you know what? He said, my failure was is that I tried my best to uh, love those people and, 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 and do for those people to the point that I got away from my vision, what God called me to do, to make those people happy and make them feel apart. And rather than helping them to acclimate to what we were doing, all of a sudden we became what they were. And I just wonder sometimes if I ain't done the same. I love you guys. One of my biggest issues is I'm a people person. And I love people. I don't like conflict. You know me long enough, you know I don't like conflict. And sometimes I go alone to get alone. As that young man shared with me that yesterday, I sat there on that table and I thought to myself, God, help me. Help me if I've ever got my eyes so much on people that I took my eyes off of you. See, leaders should lead. Leaders should, leaders should make the vision known so that they that read it may run with it. So I've had to ask myself some hard questions. God, what are we doing here? You know, are, are we just going to sit in the house and say, okay, just let the bleeding continue? Or do we come to this moment, like Jay Iris, to say, you know what, my daughter's not dying. Or come like this woman and say, you know what, God, I'm not dying here. Somewhere along the line, somebody's got to shake themselves and say, I'm not called to this. I'm not called to this death. I'm not called to this place of penalty. I'm not called to this place of judgment. Not when I got of God that has declared over me that He sent His Son to set me free. And He that the Son has set free is free indeed. Somewhere along the line, somebody's got to shake themselves out of the rut they're in and say, you know what, God? I'm not dying here. I'm not going out like this. The Lord is soon coming and there's work that I've got to do. And I just can't sit here and die in this mess. This bloody, repulsive mess I hate to be so graphic but that's what it come down to for her think about what she had to deal with folks she didn't have some of the commodities we have today I hope you know what I'm talking about 
It was a nasty, stinking mess. And here's a young girl that the enemy said, I'm going to kill her before she can even start. And somewhere in the middle stood a man named Jesus. They said, I can do something for both of them. I'm telling you today, church, we got to get back to what we know is true. We got to get back to what we know is right. We got to stand for what we know and we believe and be persuaded of that thing like Paul was. Listen, Paul went to all these different territories and ministered to all these different people. He went to all these different backgrounds and cultures. But one thing that Paul always did, he declared, I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know and I believe. Listen, just like he told them in the Rock of Dawn storm, he told them on the ship that day, he said, listen, fellas, there stood by me this night the angel of the Lord, and I believe it so even as it's been told unto me. I'm telling you, friends, the ship might look like it's breaking up. We might see leaks and cracks and all this other stuff going on, but hang on because deliverance is coming. Listen, God has a way of shifting the wind just in the right direction to get us going the way that we're supposed to be going, to be what God's called us to be. But somewhere or another, somebody's got to get a heart inside of them and say, God, I'm coming after you. If i got to get out of the building, if i got to get out of the house, i got to go find where you are and touch you at the place you're at. Let God do that for you. Let God do that for you. So, so, so we're dealing with all this erosion of truth. There's absolutely, there's people in, the, in, in churches today, they deny the virgin birth. They deny uh, Christ's death. They deny His resurrection. Some have even renounced their faith and become apostate, no longer look forward to, nor do they preach the soon return of Jesus. And while there are more than 650 million Pentecostals in the world today, there's also a deliberate retreat among many to the belief and practice of the spiritual gifts, including speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives them other. Listen, call me dated, but I still believe that the Bible, the entire Bible is inspired and it's profitable for our admonition. I still believe in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. He said, all scripture is inspired by God and profitable teaching for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Paul said the day would come when men would not endure sound doctrine but be drawn away to fables. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 4, 3 and 4. He said, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires because they have itching ears they will heap for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. Listen, friend, that day is here. That day is here. And the church's got to return back to our foundation. We've got to reach out. We've got to touch the hem of his garment and be healed of our issues that are going on. Our church today has to be healed. Our church today has to be healed. Come on, girls. See, Jairus had an emergency. He had an emergency that demanded immediate intervention. But Jesus was stopped by the touch of an older generation. You know, it probably seemed, it would probably have been easy to say to the older lady, you've been dealing with this for 12 years. A few more moments isn't really going to matter. I got to get to this girl that's dying. But along the way, Jesus stopped to touch this older generation. The pressing need of that dying girl was more urgent. So why did Jesus stop? Was it because he realized that we need this older generation to teach this younger? Look what it says in Titus 2, 3, and 4. Titus 2, there you go. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands and to love their children. Could it be that Jesus said, if I raise her up, but she doesn't have somebody to help raise her up, then I'm raising her up in vain. Could it be God said, I got to heal her because when I raise her, she's got to help get her to where she needs to be. Could it be? Listen, there's a bridge here. I'm trying to get you to understand. There's a bridge here. I thank God that we got some older ladies that'll take time with our younger ladies and say, let me tell you what it is to be a lady. Thank God for that. 
Thank God we got some men that will grab young men and say, listen, you can be men. You don't have to be boys any longer. You can come out from among them, be separate, touch not the unclean thing, and God's going to receive you. You don't have to play like little boys. You can grow up to be a man. I thank God that we got some people that will teach them how to walk, how to talk, what to be, what God would have them to be. So beyond the obvious miracles of healing and resurrection that's seen in this story, was Jesus also signaling the need for an older generation to be whole before attempting to influence the younger generation? Could it be that Jesus said, we need to deal with your issues before I can raise this generation up? Because see, hold on a minute. Let me, it was more important for him to stop and heal the issues of the old so that the resurrected young would not be contaminated with the same infectious problems. See, God desires to do the same with the church today. This church this church has to be healed in order to have integrity in our work with the younger generation. See, when God heals the older and then He raises up the new, He brings both together in order to have a powerful church that He spoke of in Matthew 16 and 18. He said, where He said, Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So what do you do? You're going to have to play a minute. i got a little bit more than I thought. Listen, so while Jesus was dealing with this woman, somebody came from Jairus' house and told, J. I, told, told Jesus, or told Jairus, don't trouble him anymore. She's already dead. It's too late for her. Don't trouble him. It was a negative report. But you know what Jesus said? We're going to keep on going on. You know what you got to do? In spite of... In spite of the negativity, you got to keep moving for it. In spite of the negative reports, you got to say, you know what? I'm called to this. It may be dead when I get there, but I serve a God of resurrection. It may be down and out according to the world's report, but when I get there, if He can just touch, whoo, Lord, I'm telling you, God has a way. See, once He'd done this, He had to focus His attention back. And while He was speaking in Luke 8 49, while He was speaking, they said, your daughter's dead. See, you don't have to go looking for it. The negative reporter come find you. People love sharing bad news. I see you got a bigger amen than that. Let me say it again. People love sharing bad news. Come on now. I, listen, they love that it'll find you. It'll come looking for you. But Jesus and Jairus, they kept pressing on in spite of the negative forecast about this future generation and so must you. Set your heart on doing the work of God regardless of the despair around you. This is what Paul said in Philippians 4 and 8. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate or think on these things. Listen, negativity is going to come. But you've got to set your focus. I'm thinking on the things of God. So, so entering the house, Jesus did two important things. Number one, he changed the language. He changed the language. See, they'd already come and said she was dead. But look what he said in Luke 8, 52. He said, don't weep. Don't weep. She's not dead. She's just sleeping. See, he changed the language. They, they said she was dead. That is too far gone. He said, she's just sleeping. So, so we got to replace our pessimistic and our negative words with positive words of faith. i got to be able to speak life into what everybody else has said is dead. I want to say that again, but I'm asking you not to clap, okay? I want you to hear what I just said. You got to replace your negative, pessimistic. I got to change my negative, pessimistic words and begin to speak words of faith. Let that sink in a minute. Because we're all prone to it. It's easy to look at the situation and declare, man, that thing's dead, man. There's no hope for that thing. When God's already said, I can bring it to life. We can say about somebody, they're too far gone now. They're in the drugs, they're in the alcohol, their life's a mess. There's no hope for them anymore. Listen, I'm telling you, God has a way of bringing people out. David said it this way. He's called me up out of the horrible pit, even the miry clay. Listen, he, David said, I was in a pit, a horrible pit. I was in miry clay, 
But God set my feet upon a rock and he established my doors. Let me tell you something. I don't care how deep you are, how far you've gone. I don't care what you've done. I don't care what you said. I'm telling you there's a God that can reach down. His arm is not so short that it cannot save. But God can pick you up, set your feet on a rock and get you going in the right direction. He can heal your issues. So he did these two important things. First of all, he changed the language. The next thing that Jesus did was of utmost significance, and I think we all can learn a lesson here. He replaced the negative crowd with just a few people. He got rid of those naysayers. He got rid of those negative people and got them out of the room. And he put in five people that represents fivefold ministry. Let me share them with you very quickly. They represented the fivefold ministry. Ephesians 4 and 11. The Bible said he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So he called first Peter the apostle. He brought Peter in. He brought in John the prophet. He brought in Peter, John, and James the evangelist. So he's got the apostle, the prophet, and the evangelist. Next, he calls in the girl's father, Jairus, who represents a pastor. He's the leader. He's the, he's the priest of the home. And then he brought in the girl's mother, who was the teacher. So Jesus has the five-fold ministry at work within, the, within this room. And the Bible said in Luke 8, 54, that he leaned over the child and he said, Little girl, arise. So here he is, standing on the five-fold ministry. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. And he's standing there. And from this, he has the ability to say, Arise. And immediately, that girl got up. Immediately, she got up. See, there's still a place for this five-fold ministry. So where are the apostles? Where's the prophets? Where are the evangelists? Where's the pastors? Where's the teachers? See, the Bible said in Luke 8, 55, that when Jesus spoke to the girl, that her spirit returned to her. What a miracle. She had a body, but no spirit. She had a body, but no breath. She did not have power. And so it is with the churches. Some people call bodies churches. They have too little spirit. But the spirit has to come back to the church. Because Acts 17 and 28 says, For in Him we live, and we move, and we have our being. It's in Him. Listen, the girl was brought to life, but she needed nourishment. The Bible says again in Luke 8, 55, He calls and calls her to arise, and they commanded, Give her something to eat. What a challenge. What a challenge. He was about to do an accelerated work that demanded more than the typical meal of soup and bread. You would think after this traumatic experience of being sick and dying that Jesus would have told her parents to move her slowly with her. But not at all. There was a powerful work to be done in her generation. I've healed the older. I've raised up the younger. Give them meat. Give them meat. Listen to me, teachers. Give them meat. Give them meat. I'm not accusing you of anything. I'm just saying that that, 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 that playtime has to be over. we got to give them meat. This young generation that's coming up, they're hungry. They're desperate. They're thirsty. And we got to give them something that's of substance. we got to give them something that's going to hold them. we got to give them something that's going to get them through this next trial that we're going through. Because God's about to do an accelerated work. God's calling church leaders and shepherds to give this generation the meat of His Word. They need this more than any kind of watered-down nursery rhyme or meaningless cliche or half-baked sermons. There's an accelerated work that's about to take place. We can't give them anything less, anything less than God's truth. Let Let me close with this. So, What a powerful combination when these two are brought together. How powerful is this? The potential is revealed in the opening verses of Luke chapter 9. The woman's healed who was sick for 12 years. The young girl was raised up who was 12 years old. And so then in Luke chapter 9 verse 1, after Jesus brings all this together, He calls the disciples together. And the Bible said that He gives them power. He gives them new instructions. This number 12 speaks of order, government, and alignment. The church, when it begins to operate in proper order, look what happens. 
He gives them power and authority over the devil as well as the ability to deliver them from all the diseases. And the Bible said they were sent to preach the kingdom and to heal the sick. So Jesus brings this older generation and heals it. This younger generation raises it up. And then when everything comes into order, they're given power. I wish you weren't hungry right now at 12 o'clock. Maybe you think about what I'm saying. He gives them power to cast out devils, to heal the sick, to deliver them. Why? Because He healed them, raised them up, and when everything comes together, God said, now you can walk in power. Now you can walk with healing. Now you can walk with deliverance. Now you can preach the kingdom of God. So what do we pray today? What do we pray today? Jeremiah 17 and 14. The Bible says, Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, O Lord, and I shall be saved. For you are my praise. You see what Jeremiah's praying here? Heal me, God. If you heal me, I'll be healed. If you save me, I'll be saved. For God, you're my praise. How does it come? Jesus summed it up with a woman. I think it's my last verse, Cat. Jesus summed it up with a woman. He said, your faith, your faith has made you well. Your faith. I asked you as a setup at the beginning of the service, you got issues. Some nodded your head, some raised your hand. It all comes together right here. This is the place where you can touch Him and be touched of Him. You can be healed, you can be saved, you can be delivered. It's all found right here at the feet of Jesus. He has a way of making you whole. And when He puts you on the right foundation, and you walk out of this building, there's an accelerated work He wants to do. And he's going to help you to walk with power. I want that power. I want that anointing. I want God to do in me what He wants to do. But I know there's issues that He's got to deal with in me. And by your own confirmation, there's issues you've got to deal with within you. But He has a way of doing it in your life. And I just wonder this morning, is there anybody that would pray? Would you go back to Jeremiah, please? I just wonder if anybody would pray, Lord, heal me. God, I've been dealing with this issue. God, I've been dealing with this stuff. It might, it might have been 12 minutes, but it's still an issue. It might be 12 seconds but it's still an issue. You might be sitting there offended by something I just said a minute ago. It's still an issue. Come on now. It's happened. It might be years. It might be months. But it's still an issue. Bring it to the Lord and pray, Lord, heal me. Heal me that I can be healed. If you're part of the older generation, pray, Lord, I've been dry for a long time. Sister Jeanette, I hope you don't mind. I know you love me. But Sister Jeanette, share with us in prayer meeting. She said, I've been so dry, so empty. She said, but last Sunday, I felt the Spirit. And oh, it felt so good. Oh, it felt so good. Let me tell you something, friend. When you've been empty and dry, somebody can just sprinkle water on you and you feel like you've been in a rain shower. Come on now. I've seen people on programs that are in desert places. And they just find a little puddle of water and they just sink their face into it and just try to get one. They ain't worried about cleanliness. They're not worried about where it was manufactured. They're not worried about who bottled it. They're not worried about what name's on the label. They just thirsty and they see water. Come on now. I just wonder if you'd still be honest with me and say, Pastor, yeah, there's some issues. But I know if I could touch Him, I could be made whole. And it's going to be by your faith. It's going to be by your faith. When you bring it to God and say, Lord, you're the only one that can fix this. And I'm telling you, He can. If you could trust Him with your issues. It might be sin. Bring it to the Lord. He specializes in that. It might be sickness. He's a healer. It might be bondage. He's a deliverer. It might be hurt. Listen, He can heal hurts. It might be shame. It might be guilt. Listen, He's already bore that. Just bring it to Him. It's His to carry anyway. It just might be cares. He said, cast all that on me. I care for you. You might be overwhelmed. You might be stressed. He said, I'm the God that gives peace that passes all understanding. 
Listen, I, I probably hit just about every one of you this morning. It's just a matter of what do you really want from the Lord today? Somewhere or another, we got to shake off the, the fears of what people might say if we actually move and just come before God, just open and say, God, here I am. I know I'm a mess, but boy, you can take my mess and make it a message. I'm looking to you, God. You see, there's two things that are re relevant here. This younger generation, moms and dads, they need your testimony. God's brought you through some stuff. Amen. I sit and talk to Miss Helen sometimes, and I think about some of the stuff she's gone through in 90 years. And I listen to her experiences, and she'll tell me how good God's been even through those experiences. Boy, that just builds my faith. I talked to some of y'all that, that have gone through some heartache and some time. They need your testimony. But let's not neglect what they have either. Because this younger generation, they got an experience. They ain't bound up in doctrinal arguments and, and theologies and fables and genealogies and traditions. They just said, hey, give me Jesus. That's all I really want. We would do well to take our testimony of how good God's been and get with their experience of saying, you know what, just give me Jesus. And man, if we could ever put those two together, we'd see revival. We'd see revival. We quit worrying about some of the stuff we'd worry about and quit getting bonded up in some of the stuff we get bonded up in. I'm telling you, there might be a freedom to actually come in our life that we could actually walk in the power of what God really wants us to walk in. If we quit trivializing stuff. Are you with me? If we quit being so trivial about things and say, you know what, God, I just want you. You'll take care of all that other stuff. Just give me Jesus. And I'm telling you, He'll do a healing in your life if you just bring it to Him. I want the girls to sing because I'm going to spend some time praying myself because I'm telling you, God hit me right in the middle of this sermon about the 12 years. And i got to talk to the Lord about that. I'm just wondering if you'll join with me to see what God speaks to you today. By faith, bring it to Him and say, God, if you'll heal me, I'll be healed. If you save me, I'll be saved because God, more than anything, you're my praise. You're my praise. Would you join us this morning?
You will. 
provider, all I've ever needed, Jesus, you supply. You're here, wonder-working power, everything you breathe on, coming back to me. Make sure that you do not interpret my tone today as from a perspective of negativity or hopelessness or that I've given up. It's not the case at all. I know some people would hear a message like that and say, man, he's about to throw in the towel. That's not the case at all. In spite of the negativity, in spite of what I hear people say, in spite of what people have told me, there's a purpose, there's a reason, there's potential. I stood on this main stage last yesterday afternoon. I was kind of standing off to the side where I used to stand when we had it all open. And I looked across this congregation as 700 plus people had their hands raised and were crying and worshiping God. And tears just welled up my eyes. I said, God, I see, the, I see the possibilities. I see what you can do. I see what's, I see what's possible. You know, one of the gentlemen pulled me to the side and he said, man, I'm telling you, the, the vision God has given you for this place is just beautiful. And this guy's from somewhere in South Carolina that just sees me once a year. And I looked at him, I said, and that's some of my negative, okay? I'm just going to confess. I looked at him, I said, I said, it's beautiful, but once a year isn't enough. we got to see God do something. And God's going to have to do it. I confess to you and I've confessed to him that my resources are tapped out. I feel like this woman with the issue. I've done all I can do. I've expended all my energy as far as what I know to do and try to make happen and try to formulate. And you know what I feel like? I feel like I'm in a good place. I'm in a good place because I'm in a place where God can take control, have His way. And I just told Him in prayer, I said, whatever you want to do, I'm in. Whatever you want to do, I'm in. I don't have to have the front runner. I don't have to have the lights. I don't have to have the cameras. I don't have to have the stage. I was just as happy yesterday running around making sure microphones were working and sound was on and lights were working and they had chairs. They had, I, I was just as happy serving that way as I stood this morning and preached to you. I just want to do something that has an effect on the kingdom. I'm just as happy as sitting in a board meeting once a month for CPC and knowing that girls' lives are being changed. I don't have to be, I don't have to, I don't, I don't, I don't need this. I thank God that I've had the opportunity, but I don't need it. 
Again, don't take that as I'm quitting, okay? I'm just saying I don't need it. If I ever get to the place that I got to have this, then I'm making it about me. I don't need this. I just need Him. Whatever He has for me. Whatever He desires. Get to the place that your greatest need is more of Him. Not stuff, not things, not titles, positions, not whatever it is that we come looking for. If it's outside the scope of who He is, set it aside. Just go after Him. And we can have revival. God can do great things. And I believe God to do that. He's a good God. He's a good God. Not worried about pats on the back or accolades from men. I just want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. When I stand before him on that day, that's all that really matters. And I believe we're soon going to see him. Amen. I love you. Thank you so much for enduring me today. <laughs> I, I, I sit. The enemy beats on me too, folks. I stood up here thinking to myself, boy, that was a real wine fest. <laughs> That's not what my intention was, I promise. But I hope you heard my heart today. I want God to do what He wants to do. And I want Him to be glorified. And I want lives to be changed. I want a difference to be made in people. I know I don't have the resources within myself to do that. But I know if I could touch Him, He could make changes like we've never seen before. And He could do things in our life that would absolutely blow our minds. We've just got to trust Him and know that God's faithful. He's going to see us through. Thank you again. I love you. I appreciate you. If you would, stand. We're going to pray and fellowship a minute. Love on one another. See what God has for us. I believe He's going to bring us through. Amen. Listen, if you get anything else from this message this morning, please get this. The twelfth year looked like a finality for this girl and for this woman. But Jesus stepped in and said, not today. Amen. Not today. When Jesus steps in and speaks His words, He might say, arise, and Lord, it might be just by faith we reach out and touch Him because we realize He's near. He's got this. Trust Him. He's a faithful God. Amen. Amen. Would you join with someone near you? We're going to pray together and believe for the Lord's will to be done. Please come back tonight. We're going to have a good time in the Lord. Just believe in and trust for the Lord's will to be done and be encouraged. God's got this thing. You might feel like waves are beating and ships falling apart and we might be having to throw some tackling overboard and some putting the helps up and getting everything to hold together. But hold on. God's coming. The miracle's coming. He's going to make a way. All right. Pray for one another. Let's pray for this service that God would just embed it in our hearts that we'd be what He have us to be. Let's pray together. Father, love you so much. Thank you for the opportunity once again to be in your house. The opportunity to deliver your word for my part, God, and for your folks to receive your word. God, even in the midst of this, I receive today. Just pray, God, that you would continue to move and minister in a mighty way. God, that you'd help us to keep our focus fixed on you. Our hearts fixed toward you, God, and what you'd have for us. I love you, Jesus. You're so good to us. Father, thank you for healing. Thank you for saving. Thank you for delivering, God. Thank you for doing what you've done. Thank you, God, that by faith we can touch you today and we can be made whole. Father, that power can flow from you into us. God, that we can be walk, walking in the power of that kingdom. God, that you called us to walk in. I pray in the name of Jesus. Lord, that you speak to our hearts and our lives. Help us to be what you call us to be. We love you, Jesus. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We give you all the praise. For all that's done and all that's accomplished, we'll praise you in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Whatever hand you're holding, hug that neck. Tell them you love them. Have a great day.